All right, here we are. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about the back half of this case. I think turnabout succession is really, really strong and probably the strongest Apollo Justice has to offer besides maybe turnabout Trump, which is a little bit more succinct. I think this case has a lot to say with only a few words and I think it's really, really sharp. And I think the stuff that we love about trials and tribulations is really on full display here. There's the winding narrative arc that concludes strongly and cleanly in the last case. There's a through-lying antagonist. There's questions about what it means to be a lawyer. And above all else, there's this emotional core, family. We have important relationships between Christophe and Clavier, Magnifi and Thalassa, Thalassa and Apollo and Trucy, Zach and Trucy, Phoenix and Trucy, and above all else, Apollo and Trucy. We don't know until the end, but this game is really about their being siblings and their relationship. And that's really, really special to me. It is a message that's resonated really strongly with me. My blood family is more important to me than anything. And as I've grown up, I've also come to treasure the families that I've been adopted into and around. And that's sort of why I made this channel. I didn't have anybody in the world to talk to Apollo Justice about. I'm the only one I know that's ever played them. So getting comments like these, and hearing from you guys and engaging in discourse about this thing that I love so much means the world to me and it makes me really, really, really happy and excited. I'm really, really grateful and lucky. Thank you all for engaging and being here and watching these long, stupid videos and commenting things. I'm very, very lucky and I appreciate your time, attention, and ideas. So. If you're watching this, if you've seen any of these videos, if you've ever left a comment, thank you. All right, let's do this. So before this last video of the series and of this last case, I wanted to plug something I just made that a few people are actually already on. I made a Patreon. It's primarily for the few anime videos I've made that YouTube won't let me keep up. There's one of Hunter x Hunter and the other is Megalobox. Uh, I think both of the videos are good, if a bit old, and I have at least five more anime videos I've wanted to make, along with a few ideas for videos that I'll keep exclusively on Patreon. So I'll take suggestions on what videos to make, about what, and I can give little behind-the-scenes stuff and early access to videos. I'll put the link in the description, so go peek at it and tell me what you think. On to the game. This is a very strong opening, as you'd expect. There's strong intrigue and clear connective tissue between what we know so far and what we know went down seven years ago. That's kind of the entire point of the second half of this last case. There's this mystery of what happened to get Phoenix disbarred next to the current mystery of what's going on with Vera and Drew Misham. And it wraps back to poker. A mystery Gramery is playing with Phoenix and some gears start to turn. This looks very similar to something we've seen before, and this case is all about connecting every single piece of this game, even pieces that didn't seem to stand out or explicitly need to be connected. And now, for the coolest fucking transitionary text ever. Seven years earlier, Phoenix Wright's final trial. And a small but cool distinction is that the color palette changes. You wouldn't notice it unless you're looking for it, but this is the original Trilogy Waiting Room, and of course, the original Trilogy soundtrack. The walls are more washed out, the painting is as we remember it, and the brightness and higher contrast makes this feel more like we're playing the original Trilogy on the Game Boy. It's subtle, but it's really good. The first line of dialogue from Phoenix is, Phew, okay, it's been a long time since I felt like such a rookie. 
This is, man, to realize at this moment who we're about to play as is so good. Our client is this guy who clearly looks familiar and is obviously a Grammarie. To call this enigmatic mystery man, Enigmar is like, yeah, that, that's about right. Phoenix and this guy played cards and apparently that decided for him that he wanted Phoenix to represent him over some other attorney that he had hired previously. As always, we know absolutely nothing about this case so far and oh my god, this little bitch is so cute. This is obviously Trucy, even they don't call her that and her design is out of the park. It's superb. Their color schemes match perfectly and mesh well with one another. I love the playing card suit motif in their pins and trying really hard not to spoil anything too early, I love that Lamiwa's brooch that we spent time with as evidence in the first case is a diamond and lines up perfectly with this established costume motif. Trucy and Egmar's dynamic is immediately so cute and his loud, wide mouth laugh is adorable. The cloak just like looks too big on her and it's insane how cute it looks. Her hands on her hips pose is perfect and I really cannot overstate how adorable I think baby Trucy is. She gives us a piece of evidence, a diary page. We're told we're going against a new prosecutor and no matter what we shouldn't worry because Enigmar assures us they won't be able to pronounce him guilty. Hmm, put a pin in that. Shady Enigmar, does the first name sound familiar? Stage name Zach Grammary is accused of killing his mentor, the Magnifique Grammary. Once again, our color palette changes to the traditional courtroom version, and we notice the small sprite of our handsome new prosecutor. The defense is ready, Your Honor. The prosecution is holy fuck, wow, this prosecution is looking very right. This is young Clavier Gavin in his first trial. His poses and animations are the same, which is nice, but his costume and haircut are really sleek and smart as a pre-time skip design. The character design in this game is really top-notch up through the last case. Phoenix thinks to himself, you're out of your league, rock boy. And this is a huge advantage of this game and of future Ace Attorney games. We get to play as different lawyers who functionally play the same, but whose monologues are totally different. Phoenix is a legendary attorney and is rightfully extremely confident. It's fun to not play as the underdog for once, and it's fun to see the gradient from Phoenix going from the nervous newbie to the mentor who is himself composed and powerful. We move on to our first testimony and Gumshoe's here. I can't believe I kind of missed this clown, but I am glad to see him. Magnifi Grammary was killed by a pistol in his hospital room. We get a photograph with a lot of detail, honestly. Magnifi was dying of a malignant tumor in his liver and only had three months to live. We also note that he had a syringe of insulin nearby as he was diabetic. In the detective's testimony, he presents a letter from the deceased requesting that Enigmar shoot him in the head at 11.05 p.m. At the end of the letter, he writes, we both know why you can't refuse this request. We notice and point out that for some reason the cloud doll nearby has a bullet hole in its forehead. It seems that Zach Grammary may have elected to shoot that instead. Again, to my point earlier about Phoenix being sort of in control and command of the courtroom, he calls Clavier overconfident and says he doesn't realize how large this hole is going to grow. Phoenix is not only skilled at finding contradictions and being charismatic and convincing, he also just knows how the flow of courtroom battles go. He's seasoned and can predict the flow of argument. We note that the pistol is a stage pistol for tricks and can fire real bullets, but can only hold one at a time. A dead giveaway, Zack couldn't have shot the clown and then Magnify. Once again, Phoenix in his dialogue is very much in control and convincing. He's almost waxing poetic a few times, he's so confident, saying shit like, the most complicated cases are always the ones that seem simple. If you had noticed a finer detail, you would have come to a different conclusion, Prosecutor Gavin. So, now we take a brief recess and take our opportunity to talk to the client. We really want to know about this leverage that Magnify has on Zack and Valen, but instead we get a confession about that which we already know. Zack tells us it's as we suspected. He snuck in, saw two pistols, and shot the clown instead of his mentor. 
Dope. We already knew that dude. He refuses to tell us the leverage on him, which we actually do need. After the shot was fired, Magnify stops pretending to be asleep and they have their last conversation as mentor and mentee. We ask what it was about, but Zach tells us it's not related to this case, which is insane and totally not true. We make our way back to the courtroom to a witness that if you didn't suspect would take the stand, you should have. Valet Grammary. Again, another fucking great redesign of this guy. His mustache is gone, but his animation and pose are identical. It's a strong design, and as with every character, it's fitting and stylish. I will also say I adore the trend of Phoenix, Zack, and Valent aging like absolute deadbeats and looking just all three so much worse after the seven years, where the girls and the effeminate Clavier look absolutely adorable before and after. And boy, this guy is still an absolute clown. His twirl is still crisp, his theme song is still maybe my favorite in the game, and Christ, he is still a buffoon through and through. Apparently Valent Grammary got the same letter as Zack requesting that he kill Magnify. Very interesting. We note the same thing Phoenix articulates it. Obviously this letter points to Valent as a very clear suspect as well. Once again, Phoenix is in the driver's seat here. So let's cross examine this fool. So if there were indeed two pistols and the argument is between whether Zack shot the clown and Valent shot Magnify or the reverse, we have rifling marks which match the bullet aimed at Magnify and the pistol that was left at the scene and not pocketed by Zack. The killer must have been Valent who saw Magnify after Zack did. Gavin interrupts quickly that the rifling marks are from that type of gun but it's impossible to tell which. This is in disagreement with what he said earlier so all he can do is apologize, sincerely. He's on the ropes this case and has no choice but to admit to a big mistake and ask forgiveness. Again, we aren't the underdog in this case. This is all to serve the end of this case. The reason that this is the first case in the series to feel like we're winning the whole time is because the payoff of the entire case is different. Put a pin in that. In the next piece of testimony, we're told the time of death had to be precisely when Zack was in the room because the IV stopped exactly at 11.10, seemingly knocked out of Magnify's arm when it was shot. There's a strange contradiction between Valance saying the IV was his lucky color yellow despite it being green in the photo. This cross-examination isn't hard necessarily, but every statement does prompt a, am I sure I want to press on this option? So. It does feel like the difficulty is ramped up slightly, which is nice. His breakdown animation is superb and really, really crisp. I don't need to hammer home how good I think this is, and to play his grammary theme instead of like the corner theme is mwah, it's so good. I love this moment. Phoenix, as if he wasn't already killing it, thinks, I guess there's no substitute for experience, but he just thinks that at least he doesn't say it out loud. Gavin points out that the liquid actually is yellow, it's just in a blue bag, which makes it look green, so no contradiction. Phoenix objects and actually says out loud, just as I thought, there's no substitute for experience. God, this dude fucks. It's quite unusual when you think about it. You did think about it, didn't you? Now we get the cornered music. The subtlety is that Phoenix is pointing this out on his own, without our input. Uh, he's not thinking hard here, and he doesn't need us to input something. He's just at his baseline a strong and clever attorney. It turns out that Valent Grammary manipulated the amount of IV liquid intentionally to throw off the time of death, which is how he knew that the liquid was actually yellow. Phoenix relaxes, thinking that he's bought himself a day of investigation, but Gavin brings up a diary. Magnify's diary ended right after Zack left, where he wrote that he'd keep writing if he was still alive. There's a page torn out, but it seems like the diary entry ends after Zack leaves. Unless anyone has evidence to the contrary. We do actually. We have the diary page Trucy gave us where Magnify continues to write that his life is 10 more minutes or so. This quite plainly points to Valid as the real killer, but there's a pause. Something about that was way too easy and not quite right. Gavin slams his fist against the back wall. Objection! You just couldn't resist presenting that evidence, could you? He demands we pause and call a new witness, but what's going on? The prosecution calls 
drew Misham to the stand. The prosecution received a tip that illegal evidence would be presented today. The diary page was a forgery by Drew Misham. Phoenix didn't have the evidence forwards, but we're trapped. We presented the evidence after all. It was careless of me. It was all a trap. Phoenix begs for the sake of his client, but the court won't hear it. Zach Gramery is found guilty of murder. Zach, however, is still confident that the court cannot find him guilty. And he says, how can you charge someone who doesn't exist? And he fucking disappears into thin air and then the goofy ass Grammary music plays and wow, I can't believe this. The mysteries were not all solved, not until seven years later. So there are some serious cliffhangers that here that the case acknowledges. One, which of Magnifi's disciples pulled the trigger? Two, where did the vanishing defendant go? Three, what about the forged diary page? Four, who is this mystery girl? Well, that one is obvious. Is that is that supposed to be a mystery? That's obviously Trucy, right? Like, what the hell? Anyways, nevertheless, we enter into honestly my favorite investigation segment in any Ace Attorney game. It's winding and doesn't make sense really, but I'll argue about it later. For now, just listen to what the game has to say for itself. You'll have to chase the truth through then and now. Think of it as a game. Don't forget that idea. We're playing a game here, and the motif of this sort of virtual landscape we're searching for the truth in has been brought up repeatedly. Phoenix narrates to us as Apollo and as the player that after we investigate things, everything will fall into place. It's sort of clear what thing he's been working on. It's a way to solve these mysteries and to clear his name. Phoenix brings up the Magtama. Brilliant. Now we have a new gameplay changing tool for this last leg of investigation. It sharpens and changes things and bounces well with the time traveling parts of this. So let's investigate. We have eight settings, four in the present, four in the past. We can move freely between them and present evidence freely between them. This for a lot of people is immersion breaking. How can we present evidence Apollo wouldn't have been able to get his hands on seven years ago? Remember what this is, a game, contextually and metatextually. We talk to a few people, young Trucy included, and oh my god, she's immediately the best character here. She just lost her father and has no other living relatives and immediately calls Phoenix daddy and talks about getting a job to support him and man, I love her. And she shows us Mr. Hat, which phew, this gets even better the second go around. It's so fun and the animation is so damn slick and clean. And I like that it's a little bit less subtle her pulling Mr. Hat out than it is when she's older. She's getting better as a magician. Her little arm moving from under the cape to make him talk, her crouching and then springing up so her hat flies up for Mr. Hat to catch, her eyes looking off to the side while he's talking. It, it's so gorgeous and perfect. Sometimes when magicians vanish, they leave something behind. That's how Trucy came to be Trucy Wright. And oh my god, I'm gonna cry. We go to Drew Studios and, okay, yeah, no, it turns out young Vera Misham is the cutest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. What a sick baby cast they made. We press Drew Misham into admitting that Vera is the forger. This is curious, but not impossible or inconsistent. Phoenix deduces that Vera Misham is the true talent in the studio without help from future knowledge that he shouldn't be privy to. Phoenix tries to talk to her and cracks absolutely the worst joke imaginable. I love that Apollo and Phoenix are both absolute buffoons at talking to women and children. He pretends to be into the troupe, and Vera lights up and has the cutest little cinnamon roll pose. We talk to Meekins, and it turns out Trucy used Mr. Hat to help Zach Grammary escape. Big surprise. We talk to Zach Grammary in the present, just before his murder. It's strange. It's a weird conversation because it tries desperately to pull two disconnected cases together, and it's not unbelievable, but it's a bit odd. He mentions the transfer of rights of Magnifi's tricks going to him, and he mentions Thalassa Grammary being Magnifi's only daughter and having a special power of observation, which is genetic, and still decides to try to cheat at poker against Phoenix Wright for some reason. 
He explains it, but it's strange nevertheless that he comes here to get the transfer of rights notarized and also to play Texas Hold'em. Whatever. Spark Brushel is here too for reasons. I can't pretend to be too hard on this because I'm really, really soft, and I do like that Zack is kind of a sore loser and wants to beat Phoenix's perfect record by cheating. It's at least fitting of his role as a magician to have a secret ace up his sleeve, and it doesn't ruin the first case being absolutely perfect for me. So we move to the coolest prison cell of all time, Christoph Gavin's little weird Bram Stoker solitary cell. So time for absolutely the coolest fucking investigation theme ever. This song feels like two titans standing in front of each other, trying to beat the other and both investigating around one another. There's still a lot of mystery about this guy, and he's going to have a larger role to play in the case than we know so far. We ask what his motive for killing Shady Smith, aka Zach Grammery, was, and he avoids it. I killed a man named Smith with a bottle because I am an evil human being. He's quite good, evidently. The board unanimously voted seven years ago for the strictest punishment against Phoenix Wright, except for one expert who wrote a strong dissenting opinion, Christoph Gavin. This dude is not just clever and evil, he's brilliant. And the other half of this tete-a-tete -tete is Phoenix, who Gavin says befriended him but has always suspected him seven years ago, and now. Five sick-looking psyche locks appear. These are clearly ludic indication that this dude and these locks are special and that it will be nearly impossible to clean answer from him. Dark, cold, full of despair. Can I even unlock these things? The answer is no, they're just here for presentation, but it's really, really, really good. He does his nails with a familiar bottle. This is a big clue if you're paying attention and also, yeah, it fits that Gavin has a fingernail routine. We go back to Vera and we confront her on her nail polish. Gavin gave that to her, didn't he? And beyond that, that makes him the client of the forgery and the one who poisoned Vera's nail polish. Vera doesn't know she's the one who forged evidence who got Phoenix disbarred. She asks if he's sad and if she's done something wrong and Phoenix just apologized and said that the next time he'll come over, he'll put a better smile on. Stand up guy. We confront Valent now. It turns out Magnify blackmailed Zack and Valent because they killed his only daughter in an accident involving a pistol and a trick. Magnify lost his daughter. Zack, his wife. Trucy, her mother. Magnify keeps his secret because he was intent on passing the torch to one of his disciples at this crucial time. It's sad, but they were family, and this chapter is about family in a lot of ways. If you cannot pass on your genes, perhaps still you can pass down your memes, your ideas, and perhaps still when Trucy, the heir to the Grammary Tricks, come of age, if their name isn't sullied, she will be a splendid magician on her own. It does no good to dredge up the past. You will not find answers, only wounds. And yet, we continue to investigate these old wounds in hopes of turning up anything that will put this incident to rest. We go to Drew Studios, which is, we're here because this is effectively the last setting we haven't used if you're wondering why Spark Brushel is here. I actually like Spark and Zack. Even though we don't see them interact, I kinda buy that they're good friends. We hear from Brushel that apparently the troop was even messier than we know, and Valent had a crush on Dallas at Grammary. Dallas also apparently has two children, and the attentive player will notice very interesting bracelets on her. We go to talk to Zack about Dallas' other child and, holy shit, it's Apollo. He has the grammar eye of deduction. This has mega huge implications, but I'll pause for now. Trucy and Apollo are brother and sister. The relationship between them is familial and that's really, really good thematically and also it's just cute. This case really is about family, and their relationship and closeness as brother and sister makes me feel very emotional. They've both lost a lot, and to find one another, even on accident, and to be in one another's life like this is really, really special. It reframes the whole game and makes their time together, the latter jokes, the exploring of the eyesight and shared ideals, really beautiful. This game, this case and this series has so much hurt 
and loss and betrayal between strangers and between family. And for some families to be torn apart by tragedy and betrayal and amidst all of that, for Truzy and Apollo to find each other. There's nothing quite so emotional in the original trilogy for me, although it does sniff and scratch at these same notes. To shake things up one last time, Zack gives us a signed confession of his murder, despite him not actually murdering anyone. One last illusion and one last strange loose end. And we return to confront Valent, yet again, seven years later. After all of this drama, after all of his heartache, and learning about what everyone has been through, I didn't really feel malice or contempt facing off with Valent Grammary. I felt overwhelming pity. He lost so much and waited so long. He is probably a worse magician than his love, his mentor, his brother, than his troop niece Trucy. His ultimate end is to perform his master's tricks, and he planned to murder someone who had a month to live. He may have killed the love of his life, and he did frame his troop mate and brother. And above all, he has no family. We show him Zack's fake confession. I am a magician by trade. Deception is my life's work, yet it seems the tables have turned. Now I am the audience, believing in the deceptions I have wrought upon myself. Valent reads this confession and laughs. There is nothing left for me now. I have little talent. I needed my mentor Magnifi's repertoire. This is something we suspected already, but don't forget how profound this confession is from Valent. His character has been nothing but loud, brash, and confident in his ability to do magic. He doesn't miss a chance to brag about how he can make something levitate or disappear, and his ego is something that was charming about him. His admission of fraud is sad. He didn't kill Magnifi, however. It was suicide. Valent used the suicide to frame Zack to get his hands on the magic tricks. He makes one last magic pun. His partner disappeared, but his guilt did not. This is kind of a great line, actually, because it's stupid, and I can imagine Valent saying it, and also because it's quite sad. He wonders if Thalassa lives as well. He says he'll apologize to his master in the afterlife. We move to the final setting, Gavin's cell. He's occupied, so we snatch the letter and spray it for atroquinine, which, of course, is positive. The letter encloses from Drew Misha, begging him to release his daughter from some spell. Just then, Gavin returns. I didn't know you moonlit in Larceny. Phoenix says he has something to ask him, and Kristoff responds, Can I steal your stuff? The answer is no. This guy fucking rules. <laughs> we leave the letter as Gavin requests. The screen swells and distorts, and it seems silly, but it's actually a really clever fisheye effect, which becomes important in a moment. It's connected to this weird pin in Phoenix's hat. It's a camera. That's how Phoenix is cluing Apollo in. That's how this weird game is working. We're replaying Phoenix's lived experiences. It's a bit strange, and some of the evidence doesn't really make sense being presented from future to past, but oh well. Again, metatextually and contextually, this is a game, and this investigation sequence is for sure the most fun I've ever had investigating in an Ace Attorney game. There is just so much learned and gained. Every story has an ending, and we've come to the final chapter. Find the truth. You're the only ones who can. Chills. To be continued. Phoenix talks to us about whether or not we'll find Veramisham guilty, but he's not talking to us. He's talking to the jurors. Courtroom number three. Preparations complete. Okay, that, that's cool. Something inside me. Rising. Surfacing. All of the clues of all of the disassociated pieces flash by. Something important, lost long ago. It's close now, so close. Again, it's insane how they keep showing effectively the same shots and still manage to generate intrigue. 
Who's talking here? What's Gavin's plan in all this? I have to mention, lest we forget, this thing is really grand and epic. Like, there have been long cases and recurring villains and high stakes, but this thing is so big in scope and so weird and involved. There's so much going on and the Jura system and Phoenix's grand plan and Apollo and Trusi being siblings and it's so good. There's a lot happening and it's super exciting in a way that I don't think any Ace Attorney case has ever been for me. The defense is ready, Your Honor. Prosecution's ready to rock. Always something with this dude. Vera Misham, acute atroquinine poisoning. She could die at any time. A trial without a verdict can only cause grief after all. Remember, Clavier knows this better than anyone. Clavier argues that her poisoning was suicide. We of course hold that Vera Misham is the victim, not the killer. And we have two things to prove. Who poisoned her and how? And we have little aid. The how is tricky, but we recall Vera biting her nails. The polish was poisoned. Clavier is worked up, of course, because he recognizes this polish as being his brother's. Kristoff tried to kill Vera. He poisoned the bottle seven years ago. I've known for some time that an impenetrable darkness lurked at the bottom of this. A darkness that has swallowed even myself. Let prisoner Christoph Gavin take the stand. Christoph's theme plays and he is nasty and cool as ever. He testifies that owning the same nail polish doesn't make him the murderer and says surely you aren't accusing me of murdering Drew as well. Trusi points out something incredibly interesting. Clavier is so tense and worked up because his brother is not only accused of murdering, but watching. He's nervous his sharper older brother is watching him prosecute. That's pretty good writing. Christoph even cuts Clavier off a few times. It's both of these genius attorneys against Paolo here. This is a wonderful case. As he mentions poisoning Drew Misham, his hand with a notable scar in it tenses and swells. We point out what we already know, that Christoph had Drew write him a letter with a poison stamp. Kristoff insults his brother, saying, we've scared him into incompetence. The stamp was commemorative. He couldn't have forced Drew to use his treasure stamp. It doesn't make any sense. Really, Clavier, you should be seeing through these weak spined bluffs by now. He's taunting his brother. We see why Clavier is tense to have him around. He's probably a terror of a sibling, and one that sharpened and trained Clavier by their genetic proximity and by the pressure being Christoph Gavin's younger brother must have brought. He's right though, Apollo decides. He can't manipulate coincidence. I'm not sure I agree with you there, Christoph. Honestly, I wanted to believe you, but the defense wasn't trying to get away with a bluff. You were, Christoph. Clavier points out something important. Christoph is manipulating the debate. We assert that the stamp was Christoph's murder weapon, which may still be true, coincidence or not. What are you up to, Clavier? The question turns to Moda, which, again, we have. Christoph requested a forgery and tried to kill both Mishams to destroy the trail. It seems incredibly likely then that Phoenix tried to kill the Mishams. Sorry, but that's not how this is going to go down. It's nice to see Apollo so confident. It makes my heart happy. He's come much further in this one game than Phoenix did in his debut. It's nice. And he's right though. Phoenix Wright was put on the case the day before the trial. It couldn't have been him. Kristoff challenges us to link him and Drew Misham, which we can, the yellow envelope, but Kristoff tells us we can't possibly have that. It's his, and he demanded Phoenix return it to him. The air quote evidence of this letter we have is a forgery by Wright, it seems. When Wright visited, he had a small camera on his hat. We have a new animation from Gavin, who's pissed. The defense's claim is denied. It feels a lot like the end of the line. The resolved courtroom music plays. Without evidence, what can we do though? Clavier objects and says, let's clean out the family closet, eh? Spinning out of whose control? 
mine or yours. Clavier tells the truth that he knew Phoenix would present the forged evidence because he got a tip off from his brother of all people. Kristoff, we were supposed to face each other in that trial. I deserved that much. This is good character development, a conflict we didn't even really know existed prior to this last part of this last trial. Clavier was dismissed as Zack's representation because he lost to him in a game of poker. Gavin is almost taunting the defense as he admits he wanted Phoenix and Zack dead. He knows there isn't decisive evidence against him. He's walking directly into a trap though, laid by not Apollo, but Phoenix, who's been behind the stakes all along, waiting for this. And just like Kristoff, Phoenix likes to win. Finally, we get to put the nail in Kristoff's coffin. We claim that Shady Smith, the victim of Turnabout Trump, is none other than Zach Grammery. The camera keeps turning to Trucy, who we expect to be shocked and hurt. She looks confused instead. What is it, Apollo? Keep going, we'll talk about it later. Did, did she already know? Trucy is, man, this bitch is so strong. We bring together the complete narrative. From the shooting at the hospital to the forgeries and the poisonings, Kristoff seems bored and asks to return to his cell. Clavier points out something important. There's no decisive evidence. Evidence is everything, says Kristoff. There is nothing more. Without decisive evidence, you're right. That is, you would have been right until now. Did the news not reach your desk in solitary? The eyes of the nation are on this courtroom. This is the trial case for a new judicial system. Apollo, who's an idiot, goes, oh yeah, I forgot. This system intends to inject some wisdom of the common citizen into the courtroom. Kristoff argues over the merit of the system, but he's too late. He's already participating in it. Suddenly, his long-winded confession of a motive he gave when he was sure he had no decisive evidence against him is looking quite bad. Incidentally, the one responsible for making this happen was Phoenix Wright. Kristoff snaps and slams his fist down. His hair flies up and he loses his composure completely, his hair turning wet and his face contorting into a snarl. He's lost. We get yet another animation from Clavier looking upwards. Not at peace, but with a weight lifted nevertheless. The law is absolute. You can't be serious. Odd, I thought you spent your life looking for loopholes. The law isn't absolute. It's filled with contradictions. The law is the end product of many years of history, the fruit of human knowledge, like a gem polished to a gleam through trials and errors. It is the fruit we receive and pass on and face in our time. And it is always changing, growing. Nurturing it is our task as human beings. Which, yeah, let's do a spit take there. The judge just said that shit. In maybe my favorite Apollo quote of the game, he says, I couldn't think of anything to say. Maybe because I still haven't seen enough, but someday I'll know what law is, and I'll fight to change it if I have to. For people who say they change Apollo's character moving forward, two points. One, this quote is a perfect setup for his growth and breaking away from his mentor, and two, of course they change his character. This is him saying explicitly he wants to change and grow. The judge addresses the jurors directly, and the TV cuts to static. Apparently the jurists are not allowed to be related to this case, which is hilarious because here's Lamiwa, aka Thalassa Grammary, aka Apollo's mom, Trucy's mom, Zach's wife. The first test of this juror system, innocent by unanimous decision. When the verdict was announced, special witness Christoph Gavin laughed. A laugh that echoed in the halls of justice, lingering for what seemed like hours. The morning after the trial, Vera Misham opened her eyes. Thank God she's okay. And Vera's smiling, yes! Okay, that's really adorable. 
This epilogue is really cute. Lamiwa is okay. Her memories return somehow, and she remembers her two children. Phoenix tells her he'll look after them until Lamiwa is ready, because he's the only one who knows how Trucy feels on the inside. This animation of Trucy crying is essential to understanding her. It's really quite sad, especially for the brave face she puts on constantly. It's a strange thing, fate. Sometimes a life is taken, sometimes a life is spared. And that's pretty much the end of my story. For now, anyways. I've still got a long way to go, and my power, well, it still needs some work. But there's hope now. We'd lost it, but somehow we found it again. That's why people are smiling again. Hope. Yeah, I think I'll keep it this lawyer thing for a while. Oops, training time, gotta go. Cords of steel. Here comes justice. OBJECTION! We get post credits from everyone. I won't dwell, but they're all pleasant and make me feel really nice on the inside. I love this post credit theme, it's absolutely banging, and wow, Lamiwa looks great. We close on a sketch of what this game is about. Trucy and Apollo's dynamic and bond. Man, this game was so good. Now I'd like to read a comment from Ron the Ron, who has worded this idea much better than I could. And I've been sort of hinting at and around. I love how Apollo Justice explores the gray area we'd only scratched the surface of in the first trilogy because beforehand a majority of the defendants had been caught up in huge misunderstandings and were often martyrs, lovable innocents, stuck in terrible situations, but here they're all much more complex. Phoenix hasn't committed the crime, but he's willing to endanger Apollo's career with forged evidence and is very unapologetic about it. Waki is pretty impulsive and has already led a life of crime. Maki is partly guilty and seems like kind of a brat for a while. Zack is insufferable in every way, and Vera is adorable, but when it turns out that she helped forge evidence for a moment, she is the closest thing to an antagonist against her own will, and as by then the player will know something is up with Phoenix and will have sworn to find whoever set him up. Everyone else in the game ties to this theme too. A defense attorney of all people turns out to be the one pulling the strings, and while we know he's bad from the first case, his brother, a smug rockstar prosecutor being one of the most decent people in the whole game and opposing little to no resistance, even when he is personally involved in the cases because of his strong sense of morality, is definitely a surprise. Wonderful comment, and side note, there are so many nice, wonderful comments like this one, and they make me really excited to make things and talk to people. I make these videos in the first place because I don't really have friends who play these games and talking to people online about things I love and you love make me feel really warm and nice. This series is called How to Write a Sequel and it's because I think that it's really hard to write outside of the first successful property of something. How do you significantly change and upgrade a perfect trilogy with a similar dynamic but different cast with different and more mature ideas and better tech. It's quite difficult. I could imagine myself saying, ah, I miss playing as Phoenix, or I miss Edgeworth and Gumshoe and Maya and the old gang, but I didn't. I love this new crew in a really nice way, and I appreciate all of the emotional and narrative nuance in the sequel. I think the characters are extremely well fleshed out, despite not getting a lot of really explicit and handholdy characterization. I think the story wrestles with some ideas the original could only sort of gesture in the direction of. The mini games are fun, the perceived mechanic is uh, interesting, the soundtrack and sound design is perfect, the sprites look amazing, the case settings are very fun, each villain is well written and compelling, and all of this is a really fantastic and remarkable game. We're super lucky to be part of a fandom that got such a rich and compelling sequel. And I feel lucky to have held your attention for what feels like, at page 9 of the script, will be an insanely long video. I love you. Thank you for sticking around, and in general, thank you for the overwhelming support on these Ace Attorney videos. I expected, and still do not expect, anyone to ever see these, but I enjoy making them, and I enjoy engaging with you all. So. As I mentioned, if you're interested, I'm doing this new Patreon so that I can start taking more filtered suggestions on what you all want to see because if I have a couple people paying me, I won't be able to slack off and not make something. Thank you so much for watching. Please, please leave a comment and tell me what you're thinking about this case or this game or a video you want to see or just anything you're feeling like. 
I love you very much. Goodbye.